Coming to you from an undisclosed location somewhere in the frigid prairies of Oklahoma, I'm your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli. This is Acceleration Radio with my very special guest, Bill Salas. Well, folks, it's obvious um, that Bill is here in studio with us, and this is incredibly uh, apropos. Bill, welcome to Acceleration Radio again. LA. Always good to see you. Absolutely. We'll be uh, speaking at the Prophecy Watchers Conference. We will, in June. In, in, in June, that's going to be great. Um, I will be at Alien Snow Fest. Might as well get all this stuff out of the way. It's up in Big Bear. I'll be at Alien Snow Fest um, on the 24th of this month. So check that out. Go to my blog, lamarzuli.wordpress.com. Dot com and I'll be up there. George Norrie, Nick Pope, Michael Barra, a whole bunch of people, uh, all talking about the UFO phenomenon, which is not going away, Bill. It's not. But look, stuff is going on here. Um, <laughs> the last four or five days has just been incredible, and I just want to kind of set the stage here. Um, I actually did a, a a PPS report on it this week, but we see, of course, the typical response from the Arab. Not they're not Arab but from the, uh, the Iranian street, as it were. Uh, by the way, the Iranians are not Arabs, just, just so you know. They are not Arabs. As Chuck Missler used to say in Ezekiel 38, there's not an Arab in the bunch. Iran is listed in Ezekiel 38. I'm getting way ahead of myself. But what we see here is this incredibly precise strike on this butcher, Soleimani, and he was a butcher. I mean, the fact that CNN and, these, and these, some of these pundits in the liberal media it just blows me away. They, they're trying to defend him as a, a martyr, and a, a religious scholar or whatever label. That, this guy was a butcher. I mean, he's responsible for torturing hundreds, if not thousands of people. Mm -hmm. He invented this little roadside bomb deal that would pierce any armored vehicle. Mm -hmm. So we've got our blood and treasure walking around here uh, without arms and legs. Thank you, Mr. Soleimani. And, and this is what amazes me. And I want you, this is my first question. So... In the days of Jimmy Carter, they took 52 hostages, and, and Jimmy was anemic, with all due respect, Mr. President. I, I honor your service, but he was an anemic, weak president who, you know, believed, I guess, that everything would all wash out in the wash or whatever. So we've got 52 hostages, which linger in Iranian jails, and who knows what happened there. We won't go into that. And then he, Carter loses the election, and, of course, they're released. So... Iran's got this long history since the mullahs have taken control of the country. Mm -hmm. And we could get down in that rabbit hole for a half an hour, but we'll, we'll, maybe we will. So the mullahs are in control. And you fast forward all throughout the years, atrocity after atrocity after atrocity. Then you look at Benghazi, nothing happens. And so the Iranians decide for whatever reason, they wake up on a Monday morning and go, we're going to take the American embassy quickly. And they attack our embassy. So let me see. Here's a multiple choice question. A, we do nothing. B, like Hussein Obama, Barry Soratero, his real name, but Barack Hussein Obama, we send $140 billion. C, we retaliate, bring our troops in and blow Soleimani. Which is the correct answer to that question? Right. Well, you know, I'm a C guy. <laughs> <laughs> I think C was the, I toast to that. the appropriate response. And I think as we see the dust settle on this matter, we're going to have further clarity and confirmation on that. Um, the situation with Obama, it's interesting to me. We have the, these Very two different dynamics from his term where he was negotiating with Zarif, their lead negotiator in Iran, mm -hmm. with John Kerry. Zarif was actually, stories would be in these closed-door sessions, a bully of sorts with Kerry, but they would appease and try to work with him. And they it's put unbelievable. The, the JCPOA together, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, nuclear right, deal. I read that this morning. Right. And, and then, so that was the deal. Now, immediately on May, you know, of a campaign promise, Trump comes in on May 8th of his first year and backs out of the nuclear deal. May 15th, on the 70-year anniversary of Israel, he moves the embassy I love it. from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now we're starting to see that the consequences of those effects are manifesting. 
positively from our, my perspective. I agree. To the point now where Iran has now been pinched as he's backed out of that deal. The sanctions have really hurt them. And they are getting relatively desperate because they've got themselves invested in their proxies throughout the Middle East, like the tentacles. Hezbollah, the people in Yemen, the Houthis, the whole deal. They're there. And they've got to fund all that. And so it's coming to a critical point where they had, uh, they've been acting out, and Soleimani was involved in charge of those Iraqi militias that are the Shiites over there. They've now they've got their a pretty good hold on Iraq. Uh, they've got the Beirut connection with Lebanon. They've got the Damascus connection with Assad. Let me stop you right there. What is Soleimani doing with Imani in Iraq anyway? I mean, they're they're not going to a barbecue and and they're you know what is he doing there with Imani? This is they're strategizing. That's, That's right. what they're doing. Oh yeah, yeah. He he was making plans, and those plans were probably going to get bigger and bigger and more serious. So Trump takes this guy out. Now Bush could have done it. Bush George W. Right. Um, Obama could have Obama could have done, done and it. And refused. But they calculated the political ramifications and decided that would be too risky to do. Where Trump is a little less calculated on those types of things, and he just does what he wants to do. And frankly, I admire him for that. I do too. Uh, and but he does his counseling. He does, you know, he does. It checks out the legal ramifications. He talks to his his envoys and his consultants. So you know, he just doesn't you know go crazy on it. But he's he's calculated these things. But the bottom line is, if you got a a bully, you just take care of the bully, and that's what he said. And you start killing American interests, killing American people. There's a line drawn in the sand. Now, this is a red line that Trump has drawn in the sand. Now, Obama drew a red line in the sand. <laughs> and promptly erased it and drew a nice pink one. Well, it was mm. this, if, if Syria uses chemical weapons, that's a red line for yeah, Obama. Exactly. Well, they used chemical weapons. Allegedly, the red line became, right, allegedly. A, yeah, became a gray line. Right. Very and gray. his solution to that was uh, Vladimir Putin was going to come to the rescue and go and help you know, and initiate the dismantling of the chemical weapons in Syria. But instead, he goes in to the Syrian revolution and bombards Assad's enemies in, into submission and keeps Assad into power, and the chemical weapons are still it's there. It's unbelievable. So now we have Zarif, who was giving Kerry and Obama a hard time. Donald Trump is not even allowing him to go speak at the United Nations. So we are talking, folks, be clear on this. America, during Obama, was... He was all about, we're not an exceptional nation. He's not about American exceptionalism. He did what he did. He allowed the Middle East to get where it is now. It's a mess. And Trump, the new sheriff in town, had to come in and say, no, we're going to stop these things. We have an entirely different approach to this sort of thing right now. I want to get into something here because I have a guy that that shoots me intel. And he's been saying from the get-go that nothing is going to happen until... The, the 1300 year old schism between Shia, which is predominantly in Iran, and Sunni, which you could say Saudi Arabia, but also Egypt and, you know, United Arab Emirates and, and most, most of the Muslim population on the, on, on the globe is Sunni. So the Iranians are in the minority. And this whole schism is 1300 years. And they hate each other. I mean, the war between Iran and Iraq, which lasted, I think, eight years, was basically Shia against Sunni. And it's the same thing. You've got an unprecedented alliance, which we've never seen before, between Saudi Arabia, Israel, Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates. And that's, that's unprecedented. But until the schism is, is fixed or, or decided, somebody's got to come up on top. Because the Iranians, the whole idea of, of Syria and then Yemen, it's like a pincer move. They're surrounding Saudi Arabia. You know, that's that's the idea. That's the whole why Yemen is attacking the Saudis. They want Mecca and Medina. So we've got a war. We, we, you know, it, it appears like Iran is out there to kill everybody. And in some ways, I guess they are. But it's really against Sunni and Shia. Speak to that first. And then I've got a lead up question for you. Well, you're absolutely right. You know, a lot of people think that the Muslims have been killing the Jews and that's a big issue. And it is a big issue. And we'll talk about that. But they've killed, Muslims have killed Shiites and Sunnis, killed more of them by far than this Jew-Arab-Muslim scenario. And like you said, uh, Iran is Persian, not Arab. So I want to clarify that. But you're right, that's absolutely the situation. Now, they they don't have a pope in Islam, right, that's galvanizing all the aspects of, like, the pope with Catholicism. So they had, the Ottoman Empire had a caliphate, but that's gone as of World War I. Yeah. 
Iran wants a Shiite caliphate, and they want the Mahdi to be charge of it. The Sunnis want to have their caliphate, so they're all they all want to have that caliphate in place right now. But they don't have they don't have a galvanizing leader per se, so they're fighting and fighting. The problem is, and in all these countries we're talking about in the Fertile Crescent, they are all in biblical prophecies. So we have to ultimately take this show into the prophetic perspective of what's going on. But at some point in time. As much as they hate each other, their hatred of Israel is going to trump their hatred of each other. Because Shiites and Sunnis still have the same five pillars of faith. Mm -hmm. they, still, mm -hmm. they still bow to Mecca, they still right. think the pilgrimage, etc. But they don't like each other because of the concerns about who should be the actual leader, should it be right. a true descendant of Muhammad or whatever. Right. They hate Israel. So, you know? but, but that has to be decided, in my opinion, before, before we jump to the next phase. because And that's what I think we're seeing, is that someone is going to wind up ruling or being really dominant in Islam. Maybe Iran goes away. You've written about that. Before we talk about the idea of, of Iran basically dissolving into nothing, um, the Iranians and, and the Shia believe in the manifestation of the Mahdi. And that's what you got to remember, folks, that, that the mullahs who run the country in Iran are... Their eschatology, their end time belief system is radical, really radical. And they believe that the Mahdi, who they, at one, if we actually start reading it, the Mahdi takes Jesus and shows him how to pray in Jerusalem, which is a real slap on the face to Christians. I think it's the other way around and, 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 and then some. But you know, their whole deal is in order for the Mahdi to manifest, there's got to be complete chaos in the world. So, yeah, we have to ask ourselves, the mullahs run Iran completely. Everything is, is, is being pushed forward. Their agenda is being pushed forward by this radical eschatological position, viewpoint, paradigm. Mm -hmm. Speak to that. Well, it plays into all the other concerns of the desperation they have. They've got the proxies they've got to fund. They've got the protests going on because the economy's in the tank because of the sanctions. And yet the big card behind it all is this eschatology that you're talking about. So, and, and I believe it was Ahmadinejad, the former president of Iran before Rouhani, who actually believed that he was called yeah. into this time frame to create that kind of chaos. And he still has, he hasn't left yet. I mean, he's still there. He's right. in the wings. Right. So, you know, that mindset is still there. And I do believe that he was not the only one of the leaders who believed they were called to this generation for that purpose. Will the Mahdi come? Will that be the the and uh, where will that take Islam? Frankly, I don't see that coming. No, I don't either. I see prophecies happening that are going to restrict any ability for Iran to even take that to the next level. Uh, dealing with Elam and Jeremiah 49, dealing with Ezekiel 30. And you, you've Persia. written about all this. I have. You've studied absolutely. it and written about it and talked about it at conferences. Absolutely. Um, so turning it to the biblical narrative, which will come and supersede all these sort of things, which will trump it all, if you will, right, is... A lot of people right now are saying, well, Iran is in Bible prophecy. Yes, it is. And they're jumping to Ezekiel 38, verse 5, where it's Persia is listed, with Russia, Turkey, a coalition of nine populations. I don't think we're there yet. But that Israel has to be dwelling securely in the midst of the land without walls, bars, nor gates, extremely prosperous Israel that Russia comes after because of its coalition for plunder and booty, great plunder and booty. And I don't see that Israel in place right now. And I think that prophecy is looming and coming real soon. But there's another prophecy dealing with Iran. Jeremiah wrote about Iran around 596 B.C. He was a contemporary with Ezekiel, but Ezekiel wrote about 20 years later, 10 to 20 years later, Ezekiel 38. Both prophecies talk about Iran in the latter days, so they're latter days prophecies. But Jeremiah's prophecy is distinctly different. It's not a different camera angle with more details right. of Ezekiel 38. Right. The events happen inside of Iran. There's other multiple reasons why it's distinct. Whereas Ezekiel 38 is taking place in Israel. So location in itself shows it's a distinction between the prophecies. So what I tell people is what's on my radar in Iran, and I think it's going to probably be the next prophecy to find fulfillment, hmm. is going to be the Jeremiah 49 verses 34 through 39. And if I have a moment, I will just summarize it. It's only six Please verses. Please do. We're here. The Absolutely. first four verses are bad news for Iran. The second two, the last two verses are actually pretty good news for the Iranians, per se. The people. Yeah. But what we have is a prophecy that sounds nuclear in its proportions. And it says that the Lord is at some point going to become very fiercely angry with the leadership of Iran. 
And I believe that time has come. Mm -hmm. They want to wipe Israel off the map. The, the theme of Ezekiel 38, shifting back to that for a minute, is when God stops that supernaturally, this massive invasion with Russia and their cohorts, he does it with earthquake, fire, hailstone, and brimstone. It's a supernatural destruction. It'll be clear it's a supernatural destruction. And he says, when that's done, I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people, Israel. They mm. shall not profane it anymore. I'm the holy one in Israel. Mm. But Iran wants to wipe Israel off the map, which would put a real damper on God's ability to make his holy name known through Israel in Ezekiel 38. So it's mm. this tug of war, we know who's going to win it. And it's not going to be Iran. So now I'm looking at this. The Lord is fiercely angry with the leaders of Iran. How do we know that's what angers him? It says, because he will destroy from there the kings and the princes, and you do not destroy good leadership. Jeremiah wrote this before King Cyrus was on the scene. King Cyrus was actually a good king and would not be destroyed. He was talked about and predicted in Isaiah 44 right. and 45, century over before he was even born. So we know it's bad kings that he's going to destroy. But why does he want to destroy them and why are they bad? Well, the clue is in he's going to break, they want to launch something lethal somewhere. And we know that because he says, I'm going to prevent that. I'm going to break the bow, probably the intercontinental ballistic missiles, ability to launch at the foremost of its might, which would probably be its nuclear grasp, its nuclear program. And they're close to that. That's right. Yeah. And Trump comes out as we speak today. First thing he said. We're going to timestamp this. I will not allow. Yeah. Iran to get a nuclear weapon. That's how he opened up the conference. That's right. His I mean, not, thank you for coming here. It's like, bam. It's like his first statement. There it is. Incredible. Yeah. He said, and I'm going to get back into the prophecy, but let's just talk about that for a minute. He also said that the attacks that came in retaliation to taking out of Soleimani seems to be indicative that Iran is wants to stand down. Right. And I want to, I want to visit that in a minute. But then he got, went on to say, we spent $2.4 trillion on our military, and we got big bombs that are lethal. <laughs> they know. It. I mean, yeah. I think... I mean, he's throwing out the gauntlet right there. The Iranians know that they're going to last about 10 minutes if, if they really push them. Right. Maybe 10 minutes. Right. So, okay, are they going to... As we sit here right now, we don't know if Iran's going to stand down. We don't know if Trump's going to stand I, I down. I would say yes. I, I And, I, you know, Trump's amazing. He's not... He's not W or, you know, Bolton or any of these guys, you know, gung-ho, let's, let's get... He's like, he's, it's like a chess game. It really is. It's like, you raided our embassy, we're going to take out Soleimani. Right. You but there's, there's four dynamics we have to think okay. about when it comes to what, what's going to happen here as a result of this escalation that has been happening in the Middle East. And it's more than just taking out Soleimani. You had the drone shot down. You had the Saudi oil field attack. You the had Ukrainian airplane today. That's, that's, Which some people were saying that, you know, it might have been a rocket. Died over Iran, all those right. people, unfortunately. Right. You had vessels being captured. Right. You got the threat of the Strait of Hormuz being shut down at Which some point. Which I want to get into because that's been my bellywick for 10 years. You know that. Yeah, that's right. And so what are the four dynamics? One is, well, is Iran trying to stand down? Two, is Trump going to stand down if they stand down? Three, is Satan going to stand down? <laughs> Four, is God going to stand down? At some point, God's going to be fiercely angry and express that and manifest this. It'll supersede his long suffering for these prophecies. He's long suffering now. You and I both know, and we'll talk about this, that he is doing supernatural evangelism in Iran through dreams, miracles, healings, and visions. So God is very busy with his long suffering and his mercy. And we covered that in Watchers 9, Days of Chaos, where we interviewed a gentleman who was a lead pastor over there. And what he told us was incredible. And if you haven't seen that film, uh, check out Best of Watchers, lamarzuli.net. Shameless plug, folks, but. You know, if you haven't seen it, it's 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 really powerful. I was there when you yeah, I know you were. It was incredible. Interviewed him, an yeah. unbelievable story. You definitely got to watch that. Yeah. But so you know, at this point, I'm going to hedge my bets that we're getting pretty close to God showing His fury. He says, "My fierce anger will create a disaster." He's going to break the bow at the foremost of their mites. And it says that he's going to bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, which is an idiom for a worldwide dispersion. He's going to bring them. And it says, I will send the exiles out into the nations of the world as a result of the breaking of the bow at the foremost of the might. It says there'll be no nations where the exiles, the indigenous population, don't go. Now, let's put a face on the map for a minute for okay. the people. All right. What we're talking about is Elam versus Persia, two distinctly different places. Elam hugs the Persian Gulf. It's the westernmost side. And there's the Persian Gulf right behind us, so you guys can see it. Go ahead. Yeah, it's the westernmost side of Iran. And Persia, it's about a fourth of Iran. 
and Persia would be the other three-fourths of Iran, much larger in scope, but still distinctly territorially throughout time, separated geographically by these Zagros Mountains. So it has always been the two different places now. So uh, basically what he's saying is that that's where the Bashar nuclear reactor is right, right now. Right, right. Now that is loaded with nuclear Russian fuel rods. It is a nuclear disaster waiting to happen. Chernobyl, it sits on a highly seismic again. location. Right. And there were earthquakes uh, in the last 48 hours. That's right. And maybe this prophecy will, be, will have an earthquake involved, but it seems like it's actually be more military, as I'll explain. <laughs> but Russia's over there now. One of the members of the JC, you know, the P5 plus one, in bed with Iran, building Bashar 2 and Bashar 3. China and Russia just recently had war drills with Iran before Soleimani was taken out, before the embassy was attacked. Major war drills. China wants Iran's oil, and Russia, and these were members of the P5 plus one, the JCPOA, who Trump said today, I want you guys all to realize how you need to get away from that JCPOA, mm -hmm. including Russia and China. And if I took a uh, bet right here, uh, they're not going to get away from Iran because they have relationships with Iran. Mm -hmm. So we got that big geopolitical dynamic it's complex, going on. It's complex, very complex. But so it says here that um, these exiles are going to be scattered into the nations of the world. I will bring a disaster upon them. And the disaster is going to be so awesome in this area, regionally specific, by the Persian Gulf, mm -hmm. probably nuclear, which will affect the Arab states across the Gulf, by the way. We'll talk about that too. It won't just be confined itself right there. And it's going to be of the magnitude that it says Iran will be dismayed before its enemies. They're going to go, oh, my God. Look what Meaning they have enemies at the time it happens. A menu of enemies, which they have today. Israel, Saudi Arabia. You talk about that alliance. Well, that alliance is because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And they know if Iran gets the bomb, it's all over. That's right. Yeah, they know. So they, you know, they that, will use it. That's right. And so they have enemies at the time. So the, the, the bad news is for Iranians right now, and, and you know, you and I, uh, we, we reach into these Iranians. We have relationships with some of these Iranians, especially the Iranian Christians. I go on TV into Iran through satellite TV with Hormoz Sharia, wow. and they translate in Farsi talking about these prophecies. And That's incredible. They're very concerned about this prophecy. The bad news is that this is going to happen, and it's going to probably be a nuclear disaster. And a lot of those are very impoverished Iranians there, and they have no exit strategy. They're going to be hurt. The good news is, and this is what some of the Iranians are very excited about, verse, uh, uh, Jeremiah 49, verse 38 and 39 says, I will set my throne in Elam. That's interesting, right? The, the same word used for the, I will set my throne in Jerusalem in Jeremiah 3. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, heaven is God's uh, throne is in heaven and earth is his footstool. Same word in Isaiah 66, I believe it is. And that's got them excited. God's going to someday set his throne there. In the Nuclear Showdown book, Revealing the Ancient Prophecy of Elam, that I've written about, I explain that prophecy, and they can read about it in the book, and then it's got a DVD as well. But the other thing it says in the very last verse, I will bring back the captives of Elam, I will restore their fortunes in some translations, which means this. It means they get dispersed, they go out into the nations of the world, and they go through the tribulation period. They do because they come back at the end of the tribulation, right. back right. into the land, restored for the Messianic kingdom. The theme of restoring a remnant is predominant with the Jordanians, with the Egyptians, with the Assyrians, especially with Israel. They've got a remnant. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Iran well, let as me, well. Let me ask you this. If, if, this, you know, if you're right and, and the Jeremiah scenario happens and you know, Iran is basically smacked down, then how are they able to remilitarize for Ezekiel 38? Right, so it doesn't it doesn't take out all of Iran. It is geographically, the Western part geographically you were talking about, specific. Where the Bashir reactor is. Right. Okay. So what transpires is that Iran still musters up its ability to be involved in the Ezekiel 38 coalition. Now, it's interesting, and, and I don't want to make a big deal out of this, because usually when people start teaching on Ezekiel 38, it's watch out for Russia, Turkey, and Iran like the big three players. Mm -hmm. But if you look at and you read Ezekiel 38, it does talk about Russia and Turkey in the first couple positions. And then Iran gets an honorable mention down around verse 5 yeah, behind right. Ethiopia and Libya. Exactly. Which is Why really is strange. that? Is that yeah, because really the strange. Iran and Ezekiel 38 is not the same military power that it is presently today? Interesting. Does something happen? Now, I'm not making a big deal out of that, but it could be a clue that we need to look at. Because if what I'm saying is correct, what's going to probably transpire is Iran's going to take a hit they're going to call upon their proxies to retaliate. 
they're not going to stand down at some point. Maybe they will temporarily here. They're going to call on Hezbollah to start lobbing missiles at the rate of about 1,500 a day. And there's Israel. no way. We sat down with Dan Gordon again, if you want to. This is all in days of chaos when we sat down with Dan Gordon, who's dual citizenship, U.S. and, and Israeli, and he's called up. He's a colonel, I think, and um, or maybe a captain, whatever. But he's, he's in the reserves of IDF, and he sits down there looks right at the camera and just says, you know, Iron Dome can stop some, but they can't stop them all. If, if, if Hezbollah starts launching a thousand missiles, you know, it's going to be chaos, utter chaos in Israel. And they will hit, they will retaliate. And that's the only thing that's stopping them. If, if, if Israel didn't have an air force and the IDF, it'd be all over. They, they, they would have done it yesterday. But they know the moment, yeah, okay, we can launch the rockets, but they have no air force. Mm -hmm. And without an air force, you know, you don't you don't rule. Right, and we're not talking about Saddam Hussein lobbying a few indis no, it's, indiscriminate these are, scud D's. Right, these are a whole Israel. different deal. We're talking about a calculated attack on the little Satan who they think it is. Yeah. They still want to wipe Israel off the map. That is their plan. And Hezbollah coming at them from the north. You know, dear viewer, in 2006, in the summer, there was a 34-day campaign where Hezbollah lobbed 4,000 missiles I remember into Israel. We talked about the missiles it. they have yeah. now are much more advanced. Many of them are precision guided. They can reach a bank of targets throughout all of Israel. Yeah. Syria will come in, inside of this thing as well. Assad, he will if he brings in chemical weapons, it's, that's a possibility. That's you got Hamas. Damascus, Hamas yeah. is there. You got who knows if the Houthis are going to start making a move up and toward that, Any, that anything war is well. possible. Iraq, the Shiites in Iraq now. Yeah. We're talking about a war that puts Israel against the ropes for a matter of survival. It becomes a prison rule fight. And what happens? They take out Damascus. They destroy the city of Damascus in fulfillment of Isaiah. And they've 17. already said that. I mean, you know, Netanyahu, not himself, but one of his his people in the cabinet, whatever. Years ago, said if you attack us with chemical weapons, we will destroy you. That's right. I mean, they've they've already told him you do this, we you know forget Damascus. Yeah. Let me ask you something, and it, it's just um, there's two things in 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 my book, Politics, Prophecy, and the Supernatural, shameless plug, which I'm hopefully going to do a second edition because it's ten years old and it's out of print, and we're going to reprint it, but I want to bring it up to speed. But there's a saying, and I, the Lord gave me this, so I'm not that smart. The Lord gave me the saying, the present political landscape is in direct correlation to supernatural events that happened in some cases millennia ago. That's a mouthful. But you never hear about what's really, what's really happening here is that Israel and the land of Israel is based on a set of supernatural events that happened 4,000 years ago with Moses receiving the Torah and the whole exodus and everything else. Conversely, on the other side of the spectrum, the Muslims and, and Iran is based on supernatural events that happened to Muhammad. This is what is coloring the body politic of both countries. And then you've got us, Christian America, despite with, with, with Barry Sorotero, a.k.a. Barack Hussein Obama, stated um, that we're no longer a Christian nation. We beg to differ. Those of us who are Christians, and there are many of us, not the Hollywood elites, but there are there are millions of us, 63 million of us at least, if not more, that voted for the Donald. And that that Christian experience has colored the body politic in, in the United States. Well, it's all based on supernatural experiences. And no one ever talks about this. I mean this is this is what's driving the Moles. We touched on it with their belief in the Mahdi. But mm -hmm. where does where does that belief come from? It comes from, you know, Mohammed and, and his so-called revelation. And the Israelis, why are they there? Because of Moses and the promised land and the Exodus. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at, and, and it amazes me how it's, it's, it's blatant, it's obvious to us, but it's, it's like glaring. All this is because of different supernatural dynamics in different countries, which have covered the body politic. Speak to that, please, your thoughts. Well, it is, and really it's the ultimate battle between good and evil, God and Satan, right? In other words, God has made an unconditional covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob mm -hmm. that they would make them a great nation. A great nation needs a people. They have what's called the chosen people. Genesis 15, you can read about this. A great a people needs to have a land. They have land, the promised land, Genesis 15, 18, which is much more expansive than Israel today. Someday they will be between the river of Egypt and Nile and the river Euphrates. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you would need a king to reign over them, the eternal king, the Messiah. 
That's in Second Samuel. And this is all 7. future, but it's going to happen. Second Samuel seven, and then they, of course, they need an eternal law of love to govern them, and the new law in Jeremiah, the new covenant in Jeremiah. So, see, these are all part of God's plan of the Abrahamic covenant, which is an unconditional covenant. Satan has always been attacking that. Kill the Jews, take the land. You know, he tried to kill their king Messiah. Of course, he re resurrected from the dead and defeated death and took away the sting. So you're right, it's supernatural in its its origins. And even really what we got right now, the ancient hatred of the Arabs of the Jews goes back to the time of uh, Ishmael and Isaac. The brothers had their feud. Ishmael was felt he was cheated out of the covenants of the content, the content of the, the Abrahamic covenant. He had Hagar and Sarah, even prior to that, the sure. mothers, mm -hmm. and had Esau and Jacob. And they, this hatred, ancient era of hatred, the Bible talks about it in two places, Ezekiel 25 and Ezekiel 35. It created in the Middle East. And as time went by and the Jews were out in the diaspora for 1,878 years, what happened was Satan comes along around 7th century and he and blankets that whole hatred of those peoples, unifies them under one god because they had like 360 different gods they worshipped back there. They bring them under all of the moon god. And blankets into a religion that hates the Jews and the Christians. She would have coincided. So that when the Jews come back in the land, right. look what's waiting them. The ancient hatred's alive and well in a religious umbrella. And that brings me to my next question. We hear these names by by the media and in and, and all media between Fox and CNN. They'll talk about the Al Quds Brigade that the Iranians have, but they never tell you what that really means. Explain what the Al Quds. Brigade is well. I'll be honest with you. I'm not. An, I'm not an expert on that, but okay. I think it has a lot to do with the uh, his ability. Uh, Soleimani was in charge of that at that point, with their uh, their Shiite involvement in Iraq, their hegemony with their proxies and that sort of thing. So I think one of their main functions in the Al Quds was that hegemony spreading out throughout the Middle East through the proxies and that sort of thing. But I apologize for not having a true definition on what. Let me means. let me just weigh in, and I I don't mean to do that, but real quick, Al Quds Quds is Jerusalem. Right. And so the Al Quds Brigade is named the Jerusalem Brigade. That's, to move to move to take that's over. That's what Jerusalem. they want. That's right. Yeah. They, they, you know, that's that's the end game here. Right. And so when you look at this, you know, they get their name from the city of Jerusalem. I mean, there's there's the Israeli flag. That's what goes on uh, in in Iran constantly. So, kill the Jews, death to America, death to the Jews. I mean, this is. But you know, just think if if Hillary Clinton, God forbid, had ever gotten in the office, and they attacked the embassy in Iraq what the outcome would have been completely different. But Trump acted decisively and swiftly. There mm -hmm. was no nonsense, so we didn't have another Benghazi. But uh, before we take the break here, um, I want to talk about their one military option. And I blogged about this and talked about it for the last 10 years. You know, when we were kind of coming up and starting conferences and books and everything else, we were talking about this. And we see the Strait of Hormuz, this very narrow waterway. You can see it right there. Um, and this, apparently, I've never been there. I don't want to be there. Um, it's just never going to happen, God forbid. But uh, allegedly, the Iranian side is bristling with missiles and all sorts of fortifications. This is a narrow waterway where upwards of 40% of the world's oil, depending on who you talk to, let's, let's be conservative, 30% of the world's oil comes from the Strait of Hormuz. The Iranians have one major offensive to really create chaos globally. And that's to shut down the Strait of Hormuz. And I posited the way to do that would be through a dirty bomb. Hmm. Your thoughts? Well, they have threatened to shut down the Strait of Hormuz on numerous occasions. Numerous and, occasions. And even recently, and like you, you pointed out, it's only 21 nautical miles. It's not. It's uh, really six. small. It's easy to choke off. Very easy. And Iran's threat is sincere. I believe they could choke it off, and I believe they will try to as things start to escalate. What's interesting in Trump's comments today is that we are energy independent. First We're time in how, how many years? Decades. Yeah. Decades since Bush, Bush Sr. That's right. We're no, he said we're no longer dependent on Middle East oil. Now, see, that's a very important thing he said because this is a threat I'm sure he's aware of. What the warning is to, and in the same sort of general time frames, he started saying to the JCPOA the other countries, Germany, France, Britain, Russia, and China, says, you guys need to get out away from that deal as well. The deal is going to expire pretty soon anyways. We've just moved the time clock up because they're the ones going to be affected by the Strait of Hormos. They are still Definitely. heavily dependent on Very especially so. China. Yeah. Yeah. So they are affected by that stuff. And so world economies will get hit hard, and Iran knows that. We won't necessarily get hard. 
get hit that hard because, you know, I mean, certainly we'll pay a price for it, but not on the level that we would have before we became the number one oil producing mm -hmm. nation in the world. And what's amazing, this could have happened under both Bushes, under Clinton, under Obama, and it didn't. It's like they were all in bed with the Saudis. I mean, this whole thing is who knows what's really going on here behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I just find it incredibly alarming that um, it's always been there. You know, it just didn't magically appear on, under the Trump presidency. Mm -hmm. But we've been under the shackles of, of the, you know, the threat of, of oil prices rising and OPEC is going to raise the price. And now we're in energy. To, this could have happened like decades ago. So we see the politics in Washington, they call it the deep state, the shadow government, isn't necessarily for the American people. Right. And, and really, if you want to talk about the, the specifics, potential strategies of Iran, let me say that again, potential <laughs> strategies of Iran. You know, right now, their focus could be economically on the Strait of Hormuz, two, spiritually taking out Israel and galvanizing the Arab and Muslim world around that kind of a move, because mm -hmm. they still don't like the Jews over there, yeah. and or terrorism, and even in America. See, that's the other thing that we, we don't want to take for granted. Hezbollah has, has spawned a terrorist network that goes all the way through South America, through Central America, on into America as well, North America here. So, you know, we don't know exactly how they're going to come with all these different approaches, but I would suggest to you it's probably not going to be, let's take Saudi Arabia out. They would probably, that now becomes lower on their totem pole. It was a soft target for them now. Take out the Saudi Arab field, show them we mean business, show them we can. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to the fact that they're being hit hard, uh, they're going to try. To, they're going to try Israel, the Strait of Hormuz, maybe terrorism to try to shut us down on levels like that. So you know, speaking of terrorism here, um, and we've talked about this, and, and I, I wrote about it again in Politics, Prophecy, and the Supernatural. And that's why I'm kind of bringing that book out again because it's it's a very I think it's a very timely book mm -hmm. where we are. But but we know in in the 90s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, all these suitcase nukes from the former Soviet Union got on the black market. That's a matter of, it, it all happened. There's, there's no doubt about that. Now, the suitcase nuke, they don't have a detonation codes. The uranium in there is, is not um, new enough or, or, or volatile enough to produce the mushroom cloud, but it makes a great dirty nuke. And so you, you buy the suitcase nuke, you put some C4 in that thing, you blow it up in, in the stock exchange or Los Angeles or wherever, and you basically have Chernobyl. And the southern border was porous, still is, thank you very much, it's a war zone. And many people believe that dirty nukes came across the border in the 90s, specifically under the direction perhaps of, of uh, bin Laden. That's conjecture, we're not sure. But the Iranians could have been involved in it too, were the great Satan. Mm -hmm. And you know they were already working stuff. And the drones over Colorado, this is complete speculation on my part, complete speculation. But the drones over Colorado recently, um, I think they may be looking for something. I think they may have devices which be able to pick up radiation because the, these dirty nukes or the suitcase nukes would still give off a signal. They would. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what we're looking at. That's conjecture. But I think that they have stuff like that embedded in America. Your thoughts? Well, you know, it's, this is a threat that we have to consider as a possibility. When the Soviet Union collapsed, those Russian nuclear scientists were desperate. They started to sell secrets and things to Iran. That's a known fact. Unbelievable. These, these suitcase nukes could have come into the wrong hands. I actually, in my novel called Apocalypse Revelation, create a scenario where these nukes actually blow up stadiums and, and things like that, this could sort of be, thing. Yeah, yeah. And we don't know the shelf life on these things, right. and we don't know all this sort of stuff. But you know what? That is a possibility, and that would change the dynamics in America incredibly. It's very more than quickly. a couple of towers coming down. Yeah, very, very quickly. So, Martial law. Yeah, so, you know, maybe this will come in and affect us. And I think that's what we try to let you know American Christians know. There's persecution going on in the world right now in Iran and in other places as well. We'll get into that in a second. We're not minute, necessarily right? sitting here thinking we are insulated from that over here in America as well. Mm -hmm. We're not going to go in the tribulation. We're pre-trib rapture believers, right. etc. But depending when that happens and how things start to blow up, we're and already seeing too much stuff. We can start to, we could start to live a different lifestyle yeah, entirely here. Absolutely. In this so, well, we're at the uh, actually past the bottom uh, of the hour, and I'm going to go before I do that, folks. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I, I will tell you this: that the fires in Australia, 
Um, I'm sure you've been following it. Our, it. And when you look at the map of Australia and superimpose it on the United States, Australia basically takes up a little bit more than the United States. And the country is on fire. In fact, the fires are so debilitating that they're creating their own weather patterns. Please keep Australia uh, in your prayers. Oh, I read these emails uh, this week, but the bottom line is people are dying in their cars. They're evacuating. Roads are closed. Roads are melting. Trees are melting into the road. Um, there are thunderstorms being created because of the fires. It's, it's a dire, dire situation. So please keep that in your prayer. Jingles, www.fightjingles.com. <laughs> Folks, this stuff really works. And, um, you know, if you, haven't, if you haven't checked this out yet, if you haven't bought Jingles, I would highly recommend you do that. Uh, because if you've got stains, look, I'll, I'll tell you, we, we took Bob and Chrissy out last night, right? A special dinner with them, Bob and Chrissy Ulrich. <clears throat> and of course, I'm, I'm eating with some wonderful lamb. It was really good. And I, I'm eating this stuff. And of course, I have a really nice shirt on. Splat. My wife took the jingos. First thing when we got home, sprayed the jingos on my shirt. Voila. <clears throat> this stuff really works. That's my own testimony, folks. So if, if you've got stains on your carpet, stain, you know, it works like, like Mr. Wrinkles. There's skunks here. Now, we smell them every now and then. So far, Mr. Wrinkles has not gotten near a skunk or gotten sprayed. But I do know this. If it ever happens, I'm going to Jingles because Jingles will take out that smell. Stains, skunk smell, blood on the carpet. You tell me it'll all happen. If you've got a Jingles testimony, shoot me an email, la at lamarzulli.net. LA at lamarzulli.net. We'll read it right here. Remember, folks, www.buyjingles.com, buyjingles.com. This stuff really works. We'll see you on the other side of the break. Keep it right here. Come on, America, what are you waiting for? Just call now or go online and order your Jingos for $19.95 and get a four ounce travel pack free. Crikey, I'll even double your order. That's two large Jingos and two travel packs for just $19.95. Hey folks, thanks so much for keeping it right here on Acceleration Radio. My special guest in studio, Bill Salas, author, lecturer, um, adventurer, <laughs> and great musician also that he doesn't talk about. <laughs> but Bill, I've, I've got a slide up here for, for the folks to see. The Syrian War, 500,000 dead. Um, it, it's gone on for years. I've read accounts of, of unbelievable torture, uh, stuff that you can't even believe. Of course, what's happening, if I digress here, a little rabbit trail, what's happening on our southern border with the cartels and the torture there, it's so horrific. It's, it's utterly satanic, utterly satanic. But that's what's happening in Syria. So, we, you know, look, I, my heart goes out. Look, people are people. We have may, maybe have different religious beliefs. They may want to kill us, but still, you know, they're people. And I don't think everybody wants to kill us mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these people... Are, 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 are good people. And, uh, you know, their lives are a complete, utter train wreck. 500,000 dead in Syria since this ridiculous civil war, the Arab Spring, uh, landed in Syria to try to overthrow Bashar al-Assad. Um, and Assad is still in power, being propped up by the Russians and the Iranians. And what we see is that everything goes down into Lebanon. So we see this Again, the Shia crescent goes from Iran through Iraq into Syria and then down to Lebanon on the, in the north. And then the southern pincer, pincer is, is Yemen, is their proxy army. So And Hamas in the Gaza. Hamas in the Gaza. Yeah. So this is, you know, basically Israel is surrounded and the Saudis are surrounded too, and they know that. Mm -hmm. That's why they're all coalescing. Mm -hmm. so, so speak of the fact that, you know, what's going on in Syria— and how it pertains specifically to biblical prophecy, because it's there, mm -hmm. and, it, and it plays a prominent role. Speak to that, please. Right. And remember that the Assad is beholding to Iran. I mean, he's not an independent leader there. He is an agent, even more than a proxy, of mm -hmm. Iran. So whatever Iran starts to say and want to do, they're going to call on Nasrallah of Hezbollah, Assad of Syria, etc., and ultimately, what we find out is Syria is involved in biblical prophecies of the end time. So I'm going to kind of just go off into that direction. Please do. Please do. Because I'm going to add a little something to the general teaching about Isaiah 17, which deals with the destruction of Damascus, the capital city of Iran, I mean of Syria. But I'm going to talk about how Israel probably gets affected 
very adversely in those in that body of the prophecies. So Isaiah 17 talks about Syria in verse 1. It says Damascus will cease from being a city. Amazing. It will be a ruinous heap. It will literally in Hebrew reduce to rubble. And it will cease to exist you know, anymore. Stop now, this, right there just for a second. Folks, that's never happened. There, there are people that will say that Damascus was destroyed. Damascus has never been destroyed, not like what the Bible is talking about. So this prophecy is future. And Bill's written about this and, and, and the prophecies which are yet to come. Please continue. That's right. Oh, this continues the inhabited city in recorded history. It goes back to the time of Abraham. It is the capital of Syria. Some people say it was fulfilled by the Assyrian Empire way back when. But I tell people, listen, Isaiah in his 66 books mentions Assyria 37 times and doesn't mention them once in Isaiah 17. Mm -hmm. But what he does mention in Isaiah 17 verse 9 is there's other strong cities that are hit. There is desolation and it is caused by the children of Israel. The IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, exists in fulfillment of numerous Bible prophecies and one of them is to be involved in the destruction of Damascus. It says in verse 14, as the prophecy concludes... At one morning, you one evening you see him, speaking of Damascus in the masculine pro, pronoun, but in the morning he is no more. He's gone. We see Damascus, like tonight Damascus exists, but we could wake sure. up tomorrow morning gone. in this scenario and it's gone. And it says, this is the portion of those who rob us and plunder us. In other words, it's Israel responding because they've been in self-defense. They've had to defend themselves, right? So that's that's a big clue right there. And how, how hard have they been hit? That's what I want to allude to. Why are they taking out a city? And by the way, they have the technologies to take out a city. And Damascus is not that far from Tel Aviv no, it's not. as the crow flies. Right. So if you take drop a nuclear weapon, which it sounds like a nuclear disaster that happens overnight, you've got to be careful about the burst altitude. It, it would, it would be a thing. tactical nuke, and I know that the Israeli, I, I believe that the Israelis have those. That's right. So it sounds nuclear. It sounds like it could happen in the very near future. Mm. And uh, that prophecy is one of the other ones we're looking at on our radar, radar quite closely. Um, so, but then again, um, the other issue with that, though, is that I think in Isaiah 17, verses 4 through 6, people need to study that. Because it talks about what happens is when this prophecy is taking fulfillment. It says, the, uh, the glory of Jacob will wane, his mm -hmm. flesh will wax lean. Now, Jacob is Israel. That's another name for Jacob sure, is Israel. Sure. His flesh will wax lean. There will be a harvest like in the Valley of Ephraim, which I won't get into what that all means, yeah, but it, says, it uses the example of it will be like an olive tree. There's this imagery now that Isaiah puts forward of an olive tree. Now, an olive tree can grow several stories high. It can have hundreds of thousands of olives on it. It's a tree that's very popular in Israel. So it's a great imagery. It'll be like the, uh, an imagery of an olive tree. At the uppermost branch, there's a shaking with only a couple, two or three olives remaining on it. So it's looking to me, L.A., that what we're being told here is that when this stuff starts to happen, when Israel's being robbed and plundered, and that's why they destroy the city of Damascus, they are hit. They are hit hard. They're probably hit from all the proxies of Iran coming at them, chemical weapons coming in. Bombs coming into Tel Aviv that the Iron Dome can intercept uh, into Haifa and that sort of thing. And as a result, they have to destroy a city. They have to they have to act out. And when that happens, I believe that will lead to either other prophecies. Ezekiel 38. No, before Ezekiel 38. Okay. Well, ultimately that will happen subsequently. So you, where do you place the destruction of Damascus then? Okay, here's how I lay these yeah, out. I, yeah. I see the disaster in Elam. We talked about it at the beginning of the program okay. in Iran. Right. The leading, leading towards retaliation by Iran. Leading toward Damascus and Hezbollah and everybody coming against Israel. Leading to the destruction of Damascus. Leading to Israel get hit hard like an olive tree in the uppermost branch. Okay. Northern Israel. To the point where the other Arab countries, leaning now towards Psalm 83, the uh -huh. Arab countries around, they say, look, we don't want Beirut to be next. We don't want Mecca to be next, destroyed by Israel. We do not want Cairo to be next, uh, et cetera, Baghdad, et cetera. And Israel's hurt right now. They're hurt. We can take now them out now at this point in time. And we find out that's what happens. And we find out there's another city that Israel does take out. It's in Jeremiah 49, verses 2, in Ammon, Jordan. It says there's an alarm of war in Rabbah of the Ammonites, which is Ammon, Jordan, mm -hmm. and it shall be a desolate mound, and Israel will take possession of its inheritance. So what happens in, wow. is that Israel then takes out Amman, Jordan, as this other onslaught comes at them. So I'm looking at that prophecy as well. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 24, when you see abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, 
flee to the mountains, and he's referring to the remnant to flee to Petra in southern Jordan. Mm -hmm. Why would he tell them to go there if they did not have possession of southern Jordan? They will start to annex Jordan. Jordan right now is a mistake on a modern-day map made by man. It is going to be taken over by I Israel. World War I, right. As Zephaniah 2 talks about Israel taking over Jordan. Uh, Obadiah 1, verse 19, talks about southern Jordan being taken over, etc. So Israel is going to take over Jordan as a result. And they do that when they win wars. Uh, Joshua did it 3,300 years ago. King David did it 3,000 years ago. Israel did it in 1967. When they win wars, they take over land. And right. that is land right. inside of the promised land. Wow. Yeah. Amman was part of the original promised land. That's Correct. right. Okay, That's right. so they're just getting what they were promised years ago. So mm -hmm. tell us about, because we're, we're coming down to the close here of the program, and thanks, folks, for uh, for watching this. Really appreciate it. But tell us um, this this new DVD that you've got out. Right, it's called The Last Prophecies, The Prophecies Within the First Three and a Half Years of the Tribulation. Okay. It is the teaching DVD PowerPoint presentation with two messages on it. The Who is the Mysterious Woman of Revelation 17 is the other bonus message. Single desk, two messages. Great. And you featured the Last Prophecies book. Right. So you've already featured that here. So that this is a complimentary enhancement to that, a teaching aid to that. And it's dealing with really important things. As a matter of fact, you sat in on the presentation in yeah, San Antonio. Yeah, it was really and good. And you gave it high marks. Yeah, really as, good. As did Bill Koenig and Gary yeah, Stewart. you were on fire. You were really good. I mean, this. some have said this is the most important teaching I've done so far. And I've been the Middle East guy. I've been, you know, that's how I got right. my, that was my bailiwick. That's how I got a platform. But the Lord has led me to try to sequence the events between now and the second coming of Jesus Christ. We did the now prophecies, what could happen at the present time. The next prophecies, what could happen with a few preconditions after the nows. And then we're getting into the last prophecies. And there's so many going on in the tribulation. I had to cut it into two books because I'm trying to keep these, at, you know, 270 to 300 page books. And we've covered the first half of the tribulation in the first book and this DVD, LA. So I'm going to encourage your viewers to get their hands on this DVD. And you can get it good. by going to our website, lamarzulli.net, lamarzulli.net. And folks, when you order that, we're also giving a, a bonus DVD. I'm not sure what it's going to be, but we're going to give a bonus DVD just just for ordering your, your DVD. So it's a great deal. And you're arming yourself. It's a threefold. You're arming yourself with vital information. You're blessing Bill to keep him on the trail, what he's doing, and you're blessing me at the same time. So it's everybody wins. Bill, it's um, I'll tell you, we are we are in absolutely unprecedented times. I've never seen it this charge, and now with Trump, there's a new sheriff in town. Um, a lot's going on with the earthquakes in Iran, the, the downed Ukrainian plane. The missiles that were fired, you know, yesterday, last night, and it, it, we're not out of the woods here yet. We're not. And things are only heating up. The good news is, in my opinion, we've got someone that that stands up for Israel, unlike Hussein Obama. He stands up for Israel. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't like our president. That's okay. You might think he's crass or bold or whatever, but um, or he, he's going to get us in the World War III. Well, that's not what's happening. You can see that he's a he's a master chess player, and he's he's moving very very slowly. It's like what what was he supposed to do? Not do anything for hitting the embassy? I think what he did with Soleimani was long overdue, long overdue. You know, Daniel so. two twenty one says this: "It's the Lord who changes times and seasons, yeah. removes and raises up kings, and gives wisdom to the wise, and knowledge to those with understanding." Right now, all the kings potentially for the end times, be them good apples or bad apples, they're in place, in my estimation. They're still trying to figure out who's next with Netanyahu and whatever in Israel, but you know what? That's all going to come to to a, a, a turnaround real soon as well, as far as a conclusion. So uh, we're there, in my estimation, Ellie. I agree. Bill, thanks so much for coming on the record. Folks, before I go, um, we're going to be in Ohio again, Nephilim again conference with Russ Dizdar, Chief Joseph Riverwin, Andrew Grafia, and of course, L.A. Marzulli. All things Nephilim, it's it's the only conference like it. Um, it starts March 27th to the 29th. We'll be going out to the Great Circle Mound. I've got all sorts of clips from films. Um, I can't wait to get into this. And if you order now by going to NephilimAgain.com and register, you're going to get a, a bonus DVD from us. Okay, so, so check that out. 
nephilimagain.com. Get your tickets March 27th, 28th, and 29th. That's all the time I have for Bill. Thanks so much for coming in the studio. All right, LA. We'll see you soon on the trail, on the conference trail. Folks, thanks for watching. Remember, I'll see you on the air or in the air. The story of the reptile called the Prince of the Power of the Air. Because there's real demonic power and forces behind these locations. I heard a commotion and I turned around and... Uh, there's no question there's a spiritual implication. Oh it was built upon monolithic stones, which so it was originally a Nephilim stronghold. So what we're seeing, we're seeing that little stick figure. From the table was actually levitating by itself. sites are Nephilim architecture, uh, have anything to do with fallen angels, and of course that means demonic activities. And something hits me right on my belt, knocks like knocks the breath out of me. 